Welcome to this episode of Creative Cabin Fever. I have a very special guest with me this evening and I'm trying out to see if I can make the background work. So it's going to be interesting. Um, I can't do it because I don't have a green screen, but I'm going to go in and I'm going to click out of it. So basically, the guest I have tonight is very interesting. He is someone that I have known for many years. Um, he is someone who's known me for many years. I am very excited. He's a voice that most of you have grown up to listening. He is someone who has helped many people discover new music, and that's something I want to talk about with him. But he's very interesting on many, many levels, and we have quite a few things in common, it turns out. So tonight's guest is Roddy Clear. Roddy, you don't really need an introduction, but feel free to say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. It's, it's nice to be here. And well done you on, on, on doing this. And I think this whole um, uh, coronavirus thing is, is forcing and, and pushing people into doing something a little bit more than perhaps you would have had time to do before uh, and, and people to be very creative. So good on you. Well done. It, it seems to be doing quite well for you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a, an interesting idea. And then a few people reached out and they liked the idea and it just seems to be growing. So I'm quite happy with that. Yeah, it'll uh, develop. Yeah, exactly. We, we'll see where it goes. So obviously you're a very interesting character. One of well, the things you. that we would have in common other than my dad, which we'll talk about. But you have a music obsession and I have a music obsession. I'm actually wearing their T-shirt right now in honor of our interview. I'm obsessed with a band called Bush since about the age of 12. Um, they are my favorite band in the whole entire world. And I get jeered the whole time for this obsession. I yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> uh, well, yes, obviously you're, you're, you're alluding to Thin Lizzy. I mean, and, and the same as yourself, I, I got into them when I was about 12 as well, uh, through my brother who, who introduced me to them. Not so, he didn't so much introduce me to them. He, um, he said, listen, I'm throwing out a, an album or two here. He said, go through them for something that you like. And I saw Thin Lizzy's very first album and I put it on and I loved it. I didn't know they were Irish at that time. Um, subsequently found out that they were, and I've been obsessed. As you can probably see behind me, uh, just about everything behind me is Thin Lizzy related. And that's only, that's only a smidgen of it all over here and, and right up above and, and just behind, uh, sorry, in front of me here is all my, it's a huge, uh, huge it's a large cd collection the vast majority are thin lizzy all the the um uh, the obvious releases the the, the the sorry the official releases and tons and tons of bootlegs and um yeah i've just been obsessed because it, it just blew my little uh, let me just give you the quick background if i may uh, to thin lizzy and, and at that time i mean when you were 12 the, i was probably 50, <laughs> so I'd already lived my life. But when I was 12 in this country, as a lot of people will relate, we really didn't have a music scene. If you wanted to hear the hits of the day, we had to listen to the show bands, who I hate. And I st I'm sorry, anybody watching who are, who are show band lovers or any of that ilk of music, uh, sorry, they just, you know, they, they, there was no creativity. They just took the songs and sang them and made their money and ran. So me and my friends were, were very, um, just didn't like it. So the only source of music we had then was Radio Caroline and Radio Luxembourg. Luxembourg in particular, Caroline was the, was the pirate, which funnily enough, years later would play a big part in my life in terms of pirate radio. But this is where we listened to our music. We, we'd hear Hendrix and Cream and all the hits of the day. So when Thin Lizzy came along, we, we grabbed, they may not have been particularly good at that time in, in, in our own little world, but they were ours, they were Irish, and we grabbed on, there were a three-piece band who were playing this incredible music that wasn't uh, covers, it was original, it was new, and then to find out that the lead singer was black and spoke with a thick Dublin accent, 14-year-old mind, 12-year-old mind, <coughs> gone. So that was the start of it, and, and long story uh, condensed down, uh, my love of Thin Lizzy brought me onto my love of Irish bands because I thought, well, if Thin Lizzy are doing the rounds, who else is out there? So I kind of check out other bands at the time as well. Some of them very good and some of them not great, but around about that time, Irish bands were starting to evolve a little bit more. We headed into the 70s then. I could go through a whole history of this for you now if you bore your, your viewers completely. 
but it all started to change. Then. And I always found myself quite privileged to have been alive at that time to see Ireland kind of come out of its protective shell. And even, even today, we see all, all the changes with the Catholic Church finally being pushed back uh, and, and to grow up in that time and to listen to me. My mother, um, to her eternal credit, she never stopped me from following the band against maybe her better judgments of her family saying, oh, you can't allow Roddy to listen to that kind of music. That's the devil's music. You know what I mean? And it was very strong in those days, Rebecca, because, you know, and they, they thoroughly believed that rock music was the devil's, was the devil's uh, work. And then, as I say, to have a black man with an Irish accent, you know, all of these things kind of coming in, but she never stopped me. And, and uh, thank God. Yeah, my my dad would have had a few issues with his mom because he's obviously a massive Black Sabbath fan and you'd know that. Yeah. Um, when he moved to Ireland first, she threw out all his vinyl. So for the last 30 or so years, me and mom have been little by little buying him back. Ozzy Osbourne is the devil. You do know that, don't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that, that kind of thing was quite prevalent back then uh, where... Yeah, I mean, you, you, could, you could read up an awful lot of stuff about the Stones and the Beatles and all bands from that era who were all, uh, according to that older generation, were sent to tempt our generation at the time. But we just didn't care. You know, and in fact, the more that they gave out about it, the more that we got into that kind of music. So they were actually pushing us further into the music than they realized uh, at the time. Of course, we loved it. And, and the fact that they, that they were up in arms. I can remember... Um, a friend of mine, I can't remember who's, which one it was, but his father, we were up in his house and Rory Gallagher was on the television at some concert or other. And he was saying, oh, that's not real. He said, look at him, said, that, that sweat on him is not real. He's only pretending to be sweating on stage. And what kind of music is that anyway? He said, that's rubbish music. You can't hear him sing. Well, he's only playing the guitar. You know, and, oh, we just turn up the volume a bit more just to annoy them, you know? <laughs> But they, hey, they, I think it probably happens every generation. It does. Now, I was really, really lucky because my dad had gone through all that with his mom. He was incredibly supportive of my love of Bush to the point where for my 16th birthday, he actually brought me to the Montreux Jazz Festival to see them. Oh, fantastic. And that's the only time I've been able to see them live because they do not play Europe very often. And when they do, I usually am out of reach or busy. So it was a really, really great experience for me that my dad was so understanding. And he's always been very supportive of every life choice I've ever made from, you know, a decade ago when I started music promotion first and all the other projects I did, anything like that. My dad's always been like, that's my girl. I'm proud of her. Well, it's, good. And it's, good to, it's good to have that kind of, you need to have that kind of support behind you. Even if he wasn't particularly fond of what you were doing, he could see was making you happy. And I think it was the same with my own mother because with the Nizzy, the first time I ever saw them, I was, I think, 13, 14 years of age. Now, you got to keep this in mind, right? 13, 14 years of age now, this wouldn't happen. And I think I, I, I told this online before. Uh, my mother was so supportive of me. I, this is the way it was. Thinizzi were playing in town. It was, I've seen Thinizzi in every lineup from Eric Bell to, to, the, to the last one. I found myself quite fortunate in that. I didn't realize it at the time. So they were playing at home. They were playing in the Carlton Ballroom in Kilkenny, for anybody who knows Kilkenny. It's still there. It's not a venue anymore. I think it was, last time I remember, it was a carpet warehouse, but I think it's changed since then. But anyway, um, I said, could I go? Please, please, please let me go. And she said, absolutely no way. He said, you're only 14 or whatever it was. And so please, please, he said, ah, put the foot down. No. So I said, right, okay. So dutifully went to bed and dutifully climbed out the back window be the little rebel that I was. And off down to the gig. I probably, I cycled down. <laughs> you think about it. I cycled to the gig, Jesus. Um, got to the venue, climbed in the window uh, of the toilets, uh, subsequently slipped and made an awful clatter. A bouncer caught me and I begged him and I pleaded with him, please let me stay just to hear at least two songs. I should have bargained for more because he let me stay. I don't know why he let me stay. Um, remember, I'm 13, 14 years of age. That would not happen in a month of Sundays now. So he let me stay and I, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm on record somewhere as, as writing this down saying that the two songs, one song in particular is my favorite ever thing is his song. It's a song called The Hero and the Madman. It's from an album called The Vagabonds of the Western World. And I think the reason why I love that song so much 
is that's one of the two songs that I heard that day. And all I can remember of it was a sea of heads. It wasn't even a sea of heads, it was just dark and silhouetted. That purple haze of cigarette smoke and whatever other smoke. And Philip on stage and all this the silhouette with the big afro on him. And that's, it, it's just, I don't remember much more of it than that. Um, got home, I paid for it dearly. I was grounded, I think, for months, but it was so worth it. But at the same time, I think sneaking un underneath it all, she was kind of happy that I went along. And, uh, uh, you know, I, she, um, she liked music, not to the, to the point that I did uh, or do, but she understood music and she, she liked it. And I think maybe that was maybe what saved me in as much as that I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't doing anything dangerous. Well, yeah, I suppose I was doing something dangerous looking back on it. But in terms of physically actually doing what I was doing, I, I stepped out of line and I, and I went against her wishes, but I wasn't going out. I wasn't taking drugs. I wasn't involved in anything. I was just there for the sheer love of the music. And, uh, you know, so rather like yourself with, with, with your band, it's, it's the same thing. It's this obsession and with your dad allowing you to do what you do and, and to follow your dream. I mean, as long as it's within the, the legal parameters, you know, what harm? Yeah, like that's a really, really beautiful story. Um, I'm guessing that the question I was going to ask you, which was the first song you fell in love with, would... Oh, possibly... outside of the Lizzie? Yeah. That's kind of a hard one to answer. And, and again, it's something that I, I, I wrote in a blog some time ago, because I, I did um, something along the, the title of it was something like uh, uh, songs that influenced me. I wouldn't say influenced me. The first, the earliest song I can remember was Puff the Magic Dragon. I don't know if you know that song or not, no? Yeah. Now, people these days say it's, it's a song about drugs and all the rest of it. But the one thing I have discovered over my years listening to music is I love a story song. So Puff the Magic Dragon was probably the first story song that I ever heard. If you listen to the lyrics of it, it, it tells the story of, of the boy and, and, and the dragon. The first, <laughs> this is going to ruin my credibility completely now. First song I can remember buying. <laughs> There's all kinds of everything, Dana. Because I remember when she won the Eurovision Song Contest, I never felt such pride in my life that here we had the Eurovision Song. When the Eurovision was, was quite credible, and it doesn't get the slag and it gets now, or it didn't get the slag and then. Here was an Irish singer, albeit North, but it didn't, at my young mind, didn't, North and South didn't have a divide. It still doesn't. Uh, but here we had this Irish girl bringing home the prize of the biggest song contest in the world, probably at the time. Um, and I, th I think that's the first song I ever bought. First serious music I got into would have been the Beatles because my brother, my eldest brother, who's 10 years older than I, had an obsession with the Beatles. He is to the Beatles as I am to Thin Lizzy. So I grew up listening to A Day in the Life ad nauseum. That particular piece, anytime I hear it, always transports me back to when I was a kid. Because he played it non-stop, along with other Beatles stuff. But that song in particular, uh, and that end piece, that orchestration at the end of it, that big long note. Um, at one stage in my life, I think I got to the point where, oh God, here we go, this song again. But now, anytime I hear it, yeah, it gives me the goose pimples. And a song that gives you goose pimples is a song always worth coming back to. The magic of music and the fact that it can bring you back to memories. <clears throat> it's just one of those incredibly powerful things about music. One of the things I... I'm working on kind of on a side project is I'm asking people to write the soundtrack of their lives. Mm. Actually, I'd love to ask you if you get a chance, if you could yeah. write yours, you know, and send it to me because I think it's a really interesting medium to communicate your soul with people. I agree. And, and for me, music has always been a savior. By that, I mean, particularly in times of stress, and I won't go into that deeply on this conversation, but people who know me will know what I mean by that, and, and I know you know that. But for a period last year, I, I, I completely blocked out music, absolutely 100%. I didn't want to hear music. Um, even the birds and the trees were annoying me. It, it, you're right. But music has saved, I won't say saved my life, that's, that's dramatic, but Certainly in times of stress and in times of happiness, turning to a piece of music can either motivate you 
or it can make you terribly sad. Um, and I don't mind that because it's meant to be to stir the emotions, I think. I think and, and I always feel sorry for people. I, I remember down through the years talking to people about music or and, uh, uh, they would turn and say, ah, I, I, I don't really have any time for music. You know, and I feel kind of sad for them. Uh, that's not many now, only one or two down the years. But as, as you well know, if you're in a bad mood, a piece of music would cheer you up. You put on your favorite band, boom, you're happy. Or you're sad, depending. Or, but it'll get rid of that emotion. It'll help with that emotion. But, and as I mentioned ago, a moment ago, those three weeks that I, I, I went without music completely, when I came back to music, I came back with a vengeance. And then as you were loaded onto the iPhone, and I went for long walks. And as aggressive as his music is generally, um, it, it just released that kind of, just released an energy in me and, and just made me feel, didn't solve the problem completely, but it just made it that little bit easier. And even now during this whole crisis, I find myself going to bed relatively early. I'm usually a night owl, but you know, it, everybody's kind of slightly emotionally drained uh, at the moment with, with, with the restrictions that we have to do, which is fair enough. But I found myself listening to instrumental music more so than music with with, uh, with lyric, because sometimes the lyric is a bit of a, a distraction, and the instrumental. I always liked instrumental music anyway, um, but even more so now. And I just again, it's a calming influence. But music is very powerful. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm rabbiting, I'm rabbiting a bit, so I do apologise. No, 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 you're not. This is a really interesting <laughs> conversation. Um, I I do find the catharsis in music very very powerful as well. I think it's completely important to feel all the emotions necessary. So I do embrace the sad songs as much as I do the empowering ballads and the more casual listening, relaxing ones. Um, to me, music would be pretty much exactly what it is to you. And I also feel very sorry for anyone who doesn't have that passion because mm. I just can't understand. Like, I'd be one of those people, music is always in my head always like I don't write music but it's one of my languages I always say it's kind of how I communicate but it's always always in there do you find that as as well like is there always background music oh yeah yeah uh, even if I don't have the phone on or the headphones on or whatever I'd be singing something in my head and it's probably the same song I sang yesterday well not sang 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 is not the right word I should say because I can't sing for nuts but yeah the, the tune is always in my head there's always some tune in there and I whistle a little bit when, you know, not a good whistler, but again, it's something that, you know, they used to do many years ago. You'd often see it, the, the blokes walking down the road they'd whistling, a happy, whistling a happy tune. But it, it, yeah, there's always something in my head and, and I'd be constantly, what was that song that so-and-so sang? And I'd, the, the Spotify in my head is trying to find that song. Uh, and it would annoy me and I'd have to come home then or, or on the phone when I'm at work on Google and just put in a line from the song. I'd have to find that song by the end of the day. And when I was working full-time on radio in Waterford, um, I had a nighttime program, which, which then uh, had the freedom to play any music I wanted to play. And I would ask a listener, listener to, to suggest songs. And somebody would write in and they would say something like, I can't remember the song, but there's a line in it that goes da 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 da. And I could hear the song in my head, but I can't remember the damn thing. And I'd have to find that song either by the end of the program or by the following night, or within a certain parameter of time, because it would bug me uh, knowing that I couldn't find the song for this person. But I, nine times out of ten, I would, and and I was quite successful at it. But yeah, um, music, huge. Yeah, there's always a soundtrack going on to answer your question, <laughs> long-windedly. Yeah, and that's probably what inspires us to do what we do. So one of the really interesting stories I wanted to share with you today is my dad. He's got an obsession with bands that have names that correspond to places. That's what I call what he does. Like he's obsessed with Texas, Asia, Chicago, and Boston. And it turns out that the Boston obsession came from a mixtape you gave him back no in 84. <laughs> well, that is, well, yeah, Boston probably more than a feeling. Yeah, that would have been probably a hit. Well, no, that was earlier. It was in the 70s. That was a hit. But obviously, yeah, it would have been still quite it wouldn't have been considered an old at that stage. <laughs> well, that's interesting, that one is. I don't remember that. Yeah, he was talking about it earlier, and that kind of, it was really interesting for me because 
it's always great to find out things about your parents that you didn't know. And I always wondered like where dad's obsession for Boston came for or where his obsession for Chicago came for. And I got an answer and it was an answer that pertains to you. And oh, it's true. kind of beautiful because you, you literally are a voice on the radio that inspires people and introduces people to new music all the time. Oh, thank you. I, it, no, I, <laughs> That's very flattering, thank you, and, and thank you very much. But uh, honestly, hand on heart, I started in radio in 1979, right? I, I was working full-time in Water Crystal. That was my job, I was, I was a cutter. And radio came along, and like, I've always loved music. I mean, my love of music didn't start with radio. My love of music started when I was a kid, like, like most of us. But radio came along, the pirates in the late 70s, early 80s. Late 70s, they started in Dublin. There was a smattering of them in Dublin. And then they started to pop up around the country and water local radio and Shoreside radio. Like WR was the water local radio when they, sorry, they became WR when, when they got the license. But there was Shoreside radio. There was two of them at the time. And I remember joining Shoreside. Tom Milan, if you're watching this, Tom, and Jack O'Keefe, they're the two people that were instrumental in getting me on the radio. I remember going to Tom at work and saying, Tom, geez, I said, I'd love to get on the radio. I don't know why. I mean, I've no background in radio prior to that, other than listening to it. But I, always, I was always kind of fascinated by it. I, my, my hero radio-wise, there was two of them. Uh, John Peel, for obvious reasons, because he played... He, he, his, sent his, his love of unknown bands, and I think maybe that's where I get the obsession from, uh, was legendary. And the other was Kid Jensen, David Jensen, who, who worked on Radio Luxembourg, and he was instrumental in championing Thin Lizzy. And he is actually the, the narrator on that song, The Hero and the Madman, for anybody who hasn't heard it, listen to it. So I was kind of fascinated from that point of view. So when radio came along, Tom was working in the glass factory with me at the time. Uh, and I can't remember the exact details, but it took any chance for another slot on the radio. So my first ever radio program was on a Sunday afternoon in May 1979, presenting the Cantwell's album chart show. Cantwell's is a record shop that was in Michael Street, where Rainbow Records is now. It has come around full circle. And the funny thing about it was, I was due on, I think something like seven o'clock in the evening or, or something, I can't remember the exact time. But I had sat down, I said, I played about three songs into the album chart. And Jackie O'Keefe was, was very busy on, on the disco scene at the time. And we were using his record decks. Record decks. You don't know what record decks are? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I joke. But he said, sorry, Roddy, have a gig. Got to take the decks. So my, my, my first ever radio program lasted about 20 minutes. Boom, it was gone. So that was it. And, but yeah, and, and then... Um, that was that was Shoreside Radio, and they moved into town down there onto the Mall in Waterford. And after that, uh, ABC arrived. And ABC Radio, it's very hard now looking back on it and, and looking at you know, you and your generation and younger again, they get the music from Spotify, from Google, from wherever, from, from YouTube, and all the rest. Listening to the radio back in those days was a big deal. So ABC Radio came along and was run by a bunch of guys from England, one of whom is Stuart Clark, who is now the deputy editor of Hot Press magazine. So we go back that long. But these guys came along and they had, looking back on it, maybe they didn't do anything extraordinarily different to what was happening in, 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 in radio, but they had access to music that they had, they had connections in America. And a lot of the music that I got into back then, bands like Steely Dan, America, all those kind of bands, they were all relatively new. And, and this blew me again. Another one was Blind Moon, Blind, Mind Blowing Moments. And that was great. And I thought, oh, I used to listen to these fellas and, and they were slick. They had proper jingle packages and, you know, the programming was, was very slick and, and the interesting chat that went on. So one day I got a phone call. I was still on, on Shoreside. I said, Roddy says, um, would you like to come join us? I said, what, on ABC? He says, yeah. I said, well, I'm, I'm working during the day, in my day job. I said, no, it's okay, we want somebody in the evening. They wanted, they wanted a balance because most of them were English and they wanted a few Irish presenters as well, which was, was great. He says, um, we'll pay you 15 pounds a week plus four albums of your choice from Sinus. 
you're such a joke of me. So 15 quid a week to sit down on my backside and play music for two hours every night. Plus every Saturday I could go into the record shop and choose four albums. So I've, I, have a, I have a ton of albums that I probably don't want anymore. Well, obviously I jumped at it. And ABC Radio to me, that was from 83. And again, in May, I started, every new program I started on radio seemed to happen in May, which is the year, the, the month I was born. And any time I started radio was in May. So from May 1983, right up to 1988, I think it was, when, when the pirates were legalized, I spent with ABC Radio and I had the best fun. Not as much fun as that has during the day because I was working during the day and I'd often listen to them on air and they were having the best time as I want to be in that full time. Little did I realize that, you know, the glass factory went the way it went. I ended up uh, working full time uh, with WLR then for, for 20 odd years. And I, even now today I'm with KCLR and Kilkenny now, and I only do uh, one program a week. Just uh, things change over the years. But every time, even now, and I miss it so much because my program is off the air because of this virus thing. They've cut down on bodies in studio. And um, even now, when I go in front of the microphone to do a program, I have that couple of moments of nerves. But nerves are not quite right, but I just want to get going. I want to get that first link done. And if I have a guest in studio, they'll, they, they'll tell you that I get all very jittery and very, I, I joke a lot when I'm nervous uh, or under stress. I, I just crack a joke at the most inopportune moments. But uh, they, would see, they would see the difference in me before we start the program and once we get the program started. But yeah, and, and I love that. I love the fact that I still get that nervous tension before I go on there because it means that you're going to perform, that you're, going, you're concentrating on what you're doing. And anybody, I think, who tells you otherwise, I won't say they're lying, but they're, they're not telling the entire truth. Most of us can go and just do it, as I do. But I always have that little, not butterflies, it's kind of hard to explain, just that few moments of slight tension. Yeah, first link is done, and chill, and relax, and done. Anyway, I don't know what your question was, but I gave you probably a totally different answer. <laughs> no, that was perfect. I call those feelings that I get, the anxiety kind of, or the, the, the fear of performance, I call those the caterpillars of success because they blossom into butterflies. Mm. But that, that's how I see it. I think it's incredibly important. It's a driving motivation to me because yes. if I don't feel that fear, I know that what I'm doing isn't pushing myself enough. Like before our interview today, I was like, <clears throat> <laughs> no, you're doing grand, it's absolutely fine. But I would find the same thing with, um, you know, if ever I'm asked to to introduce somebody on stage or whatever, or, and I've done a few, I work with Spree, as you know, as well. So I, I do a lot of work with them. And there's been a number of occasions with Spree where I've had to stand up in front of 20, 30,000 people on, on the keys at times. And there's that moment just before you go on stage where you think, oh, crikey, I'm going to make a mess of this. And that old story of, Imagine somebody in the imagine the whole audience naked. I said, "Geez, if I do that, I'd never if I can get into it." But you know, I always um, when I go on stage in those situations, I, I pick out someone in the audience. Say, if I saw you right at the back, I look at you and I'd go and I'd be kind of my. You probably wouldn't be aware that I'm looking at you, but my I'm I'm, I'm focused on you. So I'm talking to you directly. All the other people disappear, and that's what gets me through it. And once you start, then as well you get away and you get a feel for the audience and you get a feel for their mood and you know is this the right time to crack a joke or are they going to boo you off stage so i that's why i never tell jokes when i'm on stage because <laughs> i ain't no stand-up comedian uh, stand-up is is where i got my bravery from so i'm very grateful for that, <laughs> I not do that in a million years i could not do it <laughs> It's, it's definitely a completely different platform and it, you're either able or you're not, but I would recommend that everyone tries it out at least once in their lifetime because the changes yeah. that have come to me from stand-up, like the, the transformation in my self-belief and the growth I've gotten from just one performance, uh, it's just... I couldn't even explain how life-changing that one performance was. In my, in my head now, with you saying that, as I, I said to you that I would never do it in the month of Sundays. But in my head, I'm saying, well, maybe I should just give it a go for the crack. You know, but that takes a certain amount of courage. And I, I don't think I had that. Because I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm one of these guys who, when you're in conversation with people and somebody cracks a joke and you're desperately trying to think of some way to counteract that joke with another one, nah. 
I remember when I go home, I, rem- I, I, I get a punchline when I get home, but not, I, I don't think on my feet quickly enough for that kind of wit. Some people are brilliant at it, as you all know, that bang, 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 they can come out with a succession of, of, of quick-witted remarks. But no, I remember that, as I said, a week later, so I should have said that then. Well, there is a comedy club in Waterford, and as soon as that starts up again in the Royal Gallery, I might send you an invitation. Well, let's say I would turn up, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I would do anything. <laughs> that is the first step. So we'll talk yeah. about that in the future because yeah. I think it's something you'd really enjoy and definitely a completely a different outlet. <laughs> yeah, well, you can bring drink. <laughs> so one of the other questions I wanted to ask you, which brings us back to you introducing people to music, I've been asking everyone to give me an example of bands I should be listening to right now. Oh, um, gosh, that's... <laughs> Since this whole coronavirus thing started, uh, I mean, my, my, my weekly routine uh, would be Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Wednesday was showtime. So usually from Wednesday to Wednesday, but particularly Monday and Tuesday, that's when I would find that my inbox is flooded. And I mean flooded. The amount of stuff that I have now built up because I'm not on air, it's, it's actually, it's quite disheartening. Not disheartening, it's saddening because a lot of them they're not aware that I'm not on air, even though I've told, I put it out on social media quite a bit, which I, I probably should do again, which means that I don't get to play a lot of the stuff that I get sent. And some of it's just amazing music. But to actually pinpoint one or two, I find quite difficult. And if I mention one, that you know, oh, he didn't mention us. Suffice to say that uh, even when before this virus thing kicked in, I still get utterly amazed at the amount of music that's out there in this small little country of ours. I mean, we are punching way above our weight. And even the lowliest of bands who send you in the most crude recording, you can hear the potential within that band. The sad part of it is, is that band probably won't get a look in. Not because they're bad, they're not, they're very good. And, and I, would, I'd be, I would say to them, I always listen to music. I, a band will send me in a piece of music and I write back, and that in itself uh, is a huge bonus to them because they, they, they're not used to getting a reply from someone. I just think it's common manners, to be perfectly honest with you. Even as, thank you very much for your music, I'll listen to it tomorrow and I'll get back to you. Uh, more often than not, I will get back. Sometimes I forget and they'll remind me and I'll get back with that. But to answer that question, Rebecca, is, is very difficult. Um, there's a girl at the moment, if, I, if you're really forcing me, that, that uh, I, should, I should pinpoint for you. It's a girl called Lisa Lamb. Lisa sang with Celtic Connections and she's got this most beautiful voice and she's doing the kind of music that I would not necessarily gravitate towards, but her, she has a new album coming out called Juniper and I've been kind of pushing her a little bit uh, more. Uh, I think maybe it's because one of the last pieces of music that I remember playing properly on, on, on air and using it as, as a song of the week, a song called Hunter's Moon. She sounds so like Stevie Nicks, it's quite scary. Um, so if you, I think there's a video for that. A moment, yes, there is a video called Hunter's Moon, Lisa Lamb. Check her out. Oh gosh, other than that, um, oh boy, there's a guy called John Cummins. Uh, he, uh, John has a connection with me personally through Philip Linus and, and then is because he played the vibe for Phil, which is on every year. And he start, he, he's a poet first and foremost. But he does this unique type of poetry. I think he, he calls it dub poetry. And he speaks in this kind of scat talk. And he's now put a band together called, um, what's they called? Shakalak. And they have a very apt, or, uh, um, very apt song of the moment called Kindness. Um, I think there's a video for that as well. But other than that, I mean, there are dozens and dozens. I, mean, I don't have a list in front of me, unfortunately. I, I could just look up and say, oh yeah, this band is good, that band is good. And I genuinely, I genuinely love all the bands that send me their stuff, good, bad, or otherwise. And I genuinely hand on heart to any band watching this at the moment. I, and I think they know anyway. I honestly listen to their music and I will give them an honest appraisal. Sometimes it doesn't get to air simply because of the broadcast quality. It's not broadcast quality. It might be done on, on whatever they did it on. And I always say to them, go back and get a proper recording done of it if you can, if you can afford it. Sometimes I play it on air simply because the enthusiasm coming from the bands is so strong that I have to, 
I have to give it a spin for them, you know. Um, but it's it's a it's a very difficult question to answer, and I am avoiding the avoiding it slightly because I know that if I start mentioning bands that others are going, oh, he never mentioned us, but they're all looking for the plugs at the end of the day, which is fair enough because that's my job, you know. But uh, all I would say to them is, is is keep doing what you're doing, and and I. And I, I, I'm assuming maybe you're kind of leading into the music industry now uh, because of what's happening with the virus, what's happening to it. As I'm sure you're aware that there's a lot of uh, uh, live sessions on, online, which in its own way is, is proving to be very, very popular. And the one thing that I hope would come out of it is you and I listen to music a lot, and you and I are probably aware of, of Irish bands quite a bit more so than your ordinary Joe public, because it's our job. Well, I think ordinary Joe public will start seeing, I hope they will start seeing bands in a different light now, because up to now, I always felt that they thought, ah, there's that band that said, sure, they're only doing that for the crack. And anyway, they're getting paid loads of money, sure, and they're artists, you know, that they have this, this, this idea that because you're a singer, that you're making tons of money, which is obviously not the case. Try to remember that a singer-songwriter is no different to a plumber or a, a painter-decorator or a handyman. They're self-employed, and now their income has been literally cut off. And I have to say, I'm full of admiration for anybody I've seen online. They're 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 being as creative and thinking outside the box as much as they possibly can. And I would encourage people if you hear someone say like Lisa or whoever the case may be, they all have somewhere where you can download the music. Do so. It's only ninety nine cents in some cases, maybe two quid in another, and you know. Uh, help them out. Music, as we said earlier on, is powerful and you will find something amongst Irish bands that will suit your needs. That's another long-winded answer for you. <laughs> no, and it leads me into two different personal things. So I, I recently enough released a video on the Viking page urging people to buy band merchandise in these yeah. times to try and support the That's artists true. and stream as much original music as possible, again, to support the artists. And then obviously with the live streams that are going on, there are a lot of campaigns such as Buy Me A Coffee, which do allow people to donate money directly to the artists. And that should all be noted and respected. The other thing you're saying about Ireland being a hard platform to launch from, you're completely correct. And that brings me back to my obsession. I watched an interview that Bush did in 1995 and they went back to the UK in order to try and get a UK audience. The only reason they ever made it big is because they got a record deal in America and they were selling out arenas with 15,000 people and no one in England knew who they were. Tends to happen with Irish bands too. Look at the script. Yeah. They couldn't get arrested in Ireland. They go away and they, and they work hard, not particularly in my kind of music, People often say to me, oh, you don't listen to the script. But I said, no, it's not my go-to music. It doesn't mean I don't, I don't respect what they've done because what they've done, and, and there's likes, likes of Bush as well, they work their backsides off. And the fact that they get recognized, and then of course they come back and everybody says, oh yeah, I've been following that band for years. Oh yeah, because they all want to be cool and trendy. Let's just stick to your guns. If you didn't like them then, you're not going to like them now. Just because they're trendy doesn't mean you have to jump on that bandwagon. But anyway, that's a whole other debate, I guess. You know, so good on them for doing that. If they, if they get recognized in America and, and they're making their living out there, it just means that, that the, the, the kickback is when they come back home, that they have the audiences over here as well. So that's, that's fair enough too. It's a tough old business and any break you can get, take it. You know? I agree. And it is such a shame that Ireland is so overlooked in these matters because you're correct. We have so much, so much talent. There is a weird creative flux happening right now within the industry where people actually have time to create. And I believe that when we come out of this, the magic of what's going to leave. Yeah, I think, I think we're going to have bands called uh, Flatten the Curve or a song called Flatten the Curve or the Pandemic Whatever. <laughs> you know, but I, and yeah, you're right. I, I, I think we're going to see and hear a lot of good stuff coming out of it because... Uh, well, anybody in, in creative mode, be they bands or, or poets or, or writers or whatever, I think they have the time to think. I even find myself trying, and I do mean trying to be poetry, to do a bit of poetry, not very good at it. It's, that is a skill in itself. Um, but yeah, I think there'll be, a, there'll be a huge creative 
output once we come out of all of this, hopefully, and it can only be for the better. And I'm really hoping it's going to make people realise how important gig attendance is. So yeah. I wanted to ask you about memorable gigs you'd been to or memorable experiences at gigs, if you wouldn't mind sharing that. Um, again, when, when, when I was younger and, and in Waterford in particular, and Waterford uh, back in those days had a very vibrant live scene. There were some great venues. Unfortunately, we don't have that now. And, and, and what's after happening recently has, has even pushed that down further. But the first answer I'll always give you in a music related question, no matter what it is, will always come back to Thin Lizzy. Always. I've seen them 11, 12, 13 times, but I suppose the biggest gig that I saw them at, and the one I got such a kick out of, uh, was 1977, uh, Daily Mount Park. It was kind of a homecoming. The, ab the album Live and Dangerous had just really just sold, like they were held off the top of the charts by the Bee Gees. And I always hated the Bee Gees for years. Uh, uh, <laughs> Live and Dangerous was, was number two. And they came home and it was Phil and Thin Lizzy at their peak. You had the Boomtown Rats in support. You had, um, do I have a poster here beside me? You should have it there somewhere. There was the Graham Parker and the Rumour. It was in Daily Mount Park. And I just remember, anybody who's been to a Thin Lizzy concert, particularly with when Philip was alive and, and that classic lineup of Philip, Brian Robertson, Brian Downey and Scott Gorham. They were just power personified. And you could feel it hitting you on the chest and you go, oh, like the aggression. And I remember that day as being, obviously a Thin Izzy fan, I was, I was excited anyway, but it was just, there was a magic in the air. It was, it was around the time of his birthday, August time. His, his birthday is August 20th. And, and that, that stands out in my mind very much. And the other one of Thin Izzy would have been a little later than in 1981. They were the first band to play Slain with a very young U2 in support. And the, the biggest thing I remember of that day was Bono and the boys on stage. And Bono was given at socks, being as arrogant and being the bollocks that he can be, you know. Uh, he was there and he was strutting his stuff on stage and he was, he was winning. He, was, he had the crowd in the, in the palm of his hands. But legend has it that Phil saw this. And he said, uh-uh, this ain't going to happen to my gig, pal. This is my gig. So he had the helicopter fly in and fly over the stage and land, as you look at the stage, to stage right, backstage. And of course, everybody in the audience said, that's the band. So everybody went woof, over to the right-hand side of the, of the field <laughs> and left Bono and the boys kind of singing to almost, well, I won't say empty, but you know what I mean? Everybody was obsessed with the fact that Phil and the band had arrived. That stands out in my mind very, very much. So I, I don't think there was too many at that in terms of what you would get at a slaying gig now. I think probably about five, ten thousand 10,000 people at it, as opposed to about 120,000 or um, Slain with uh, Springsteen, I think, had 120,000. I was at that one as well. Uh, other than Tim Lizzy, I, I wasn't... Um, oh, uh, yeah, sorry, it just popped into my head. A memorable gig is in Garter Lane in Waterford. Peter Green from Fleetwood Mac. Peter Green, he, a legendary blues guitarist. And I remember thinking, Peter Green is going to play in, in Garter Lane. Are you kidding? And I thought, oh, okay, I've got to check this one out because Peter Green, I, I, I was a Fleetwood Mac fan, uh, not the, the band we all know and love now, but I, I like the blues. Blues is another favorite genre of music of mine. And um, the chap that was running it, I said, is there any possibility I could get an interview with, with Peter Green? Now, Peter Green, I don't know how many people would know this, but he was notoriously hard to interview because he had been a hermit for many, many years and he had hidden away and he had a lot of problems mentally and he was discovered. So the chat that was running at Dave, Dave, uh, Dave, I can't remember his surname, but anyway, um, so I'll see what I can do for you. So Nigel Watson was a, uh, had a band. It was Peter Green and Nigel Watson Blues or something like that. So I rearranged for the interview and I was told, you're under no circumstances to shake his hands. You're under no circumstances to bring up the whole drugs thing. So I said, okay, fine. So I waited around and I was made to wait. I was made to wait a long time, but I said it was worth waiting for because this is Peter Green, a legend. Look him up. He's Albatross. Do you know that song? Yeah. A man of the world. He's the guitar player on that. Absolutely amazing guitar. But anyway, Peter arrives in. He's wearing a skull cap. 
And I recognized him all right. He was an older man now, obviously, from the photographs I remember, because then he had long hair and a tash and all the rest. But the moment he walked in, first thing I do, oh yeah, put out the hand. And he kind of very slowly put the hand in his hand and shook it very tentatively. And, and then I remembered, oh crap, I wasn't supposed to do that. Anyway, we sat down and we sat down, we did this interview. And I asked him about the drugs. I asked him about the drug treatment and all the rest of it. And he answered me. Now, the sad thing about it is I've, I've mislaid that tape. I don't have it anymore. I, I really regret that. But I could see Nigel in the corner looking at me with daggers in his eyes. You weren't supposed to ask about that, but Peter was quite happy to talk about it. Now, he wasn't very lucid. He was obviously, at the time, still maybe messed up, but I didn't care. I was still talking to Peter Green. I was in his presence, uh, you know. And that night, he didn't sing that night particularly, but he played, and he, and he was kept apologizing. He played, I think we did two gigs, and he kept apologizing for the fact that he wasn't playing very well. Now, I'm not a guitarist, but whatever he, if he was playing badly, if that's playing badly, I, could, I, I couldn't wait to hear him playing really well. It was, and that gigs, I don't know, that just popped into my head. Other than that, uh, Rebecca, big gigs, uh, I think the last big gig I was at was Jean-Michel Jarre, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, instrumental music. Um, my wife the first that. concert I ever went to when I was nine years old or ten years <laughs> old was Jean-Michel Jarre. There you go. Amazing gig. And it was my wife bought me the ticket for my for my birthday, God bless her. And she came along. Actually, she bought the <laughs> she bought the ticket thinking it was Mike Goldfield. It was Mike Goldfield, I am obsessed with him as well. So she said, I'd buy the ticket anyway, because it said if, if we don't make that gig, he would give out that we didn't go to it. But as it turned out, Jean Michel was astoundingly brilliant. One man, a couple of computers and a couple of drummers, and it, it was amazing. Um Gig going, I don't get to as many gigs as, these days as I would like to go to. I think they've gone too expensive, uh, quite frankly. Uh, I, don't, I don't think a lot of them are worth the money that they're charging. They're very good and all the rest, but I mean to pay upwards of 200 quid for a couple of hours. Sorry, call me miserly, but that's the way I think about it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I also adore Michael Field. Uh, Moonlight Shadow is one of those songs that brings me back to my dad like you wouldn't believe. I remember sitting on his lap with that vinyl playing in, in the study I, room, you know. I got into him um, 1975, I think it was. I used to travel. I'm from Kilkenny originally. And I came down here. I used to go home at weekends and I used to bump into my friend Liam. And Liam called me into his house one day. I used to call up to him anyway. He said, you have to listen to this album. I said, what is it? It's called Tubular Bells. Have a listen. And he put it on. And after about five minutes, I said, what the hell? Oh, this is crap. <laughs> what the hell? You know, what are you making me listen to? But it's one of those albums that it gets into you. It's a little earworm. Oh, yeah, that little section was lovely. So I went back to it and went back to it and went back to it. And I eventually became obsessed with everything that Mike Oldfield did, I have all his, I have all his stuff on vinyl and on CD as well. Uh, um, I never actually got to see the guy proper, but oh, I did. Sorry, in well, just, yeah, anyway, I got to come back to another time. But he, um, he's just one of those people who, got, like I talked to you earlier on, I said to you earlier about um, instrumental music. Tubular Bells Two is my real go-to album. I listen to it ad nauseum and constantly listen. And that's a great walking piece of music for me in the years and gone you're lost in that piece of music and i can get totally lost. i'm almost um almost hypnotized when i walk to that kind of music because everything else around me just seems to disappear how do we get onto that anyway <laughs> yeah but it doesn't matter the, the conversation is going exactly the way it is supposed to um it's true there is a kind of a transformative hypnotic quality to instrumental music of the magnitude like mike goldfield and it's transportation to allow you to be able to be here, but not be here, almost like a meditative state. Yeah. yeah it's very healing. You should listen to, I don't know if you ever saw the documentary on Mike Oldfield. Uh, he's a fascinating character. He's, he is, uh, he hears the music in his head and he gets very annoyed when, uh, I think in one section of that, of that um, documentary, um, why did you write this piece of music, Tubular Bells? And he looked at the interviewer as if to say, well, why wouldn't I? It's in my head. You know, and I, I, I could see his frustration. Why ask me such a stupid question? It's in my head. I have to get it from my head 
to my instruments or you know to a piece of paper and i don't think even i don't think he even wrote the music and it just went straight in or people should remember i, I, I know you know the story in the, the original tube rebels he played every single instrument he did all the multi-layering of it and this is in the age of analog not digital doing it in, that's why it's tube rebels 2 was such a success because he had all this digital and he probably did it in half the time and I think Richard Branson paid him, he, he wanted him so much to do this, he gave him his old Bentley as part payment for doing this. I can't remember the exact details of it, but it's a fascinating story. And he's a, he's a fascinating person. And he's one man. I think if I had a wish list of people to interview, it would be him. The other person would, the other person would be Philip Lynott again. I interviewed him back in 82, but I'd love to be able to interview him now. But Mike Oldfield would be fascinating to talk to. And I'm a non-musician. He'd probably throw me out of the room anyway because I know nothing about actually creating music, but I, I find him extraordinarily fascinating. Yeah, I was about to ask about the top interviews that you've done in your career so far. So obviously I listened to that very famous interview when you put it up yesterday and that's why I reached out to you because I was just like, wow, so it's actually possible to interview your heroes. Oh yeah. You see, the thing about it is, uh, well, with Philip it was different uh, because and I think I mentioned on, on, uh, in my little, um, little blog that I wrote up with that, that he was my obsession, and still is. He, I'm fascinated by the man. Uh, it's a bromance uh, in, in, in all the best sense of the word. I mean, I could spend another 40 minutes talking to you about my obsession with him and, and my association with, with the Roisin Love Trust and with, with Philomena, his mom, uh, who sadly died last year. And uh, she and I were great, great friends. But when I got the opportunity to meet Phil, as you would probably feel if you got to meet your band, oh my God, I'm getting, you gotta be cool here, Roddy. You gotta, you gotta at least pretend that you know what you're talking about. And again, as I mentioned in that little blog, I wrote down question after question and I knew that, okay, I can't swamp the man with questions. A, we wouldn't have time and B, I just wanted to get the most pertinent questions I could. And, and, and I listened to that interview now I still cringe a little bit because I can hear, I can hear the over enthusiastic 24 year old me. But at the same time, I'm, I'm quite proud of that interview. I didn't make a complete hames of it. I thought some of the questions were quite pertinent. In particular, the question I asked him about, um, what would you do if the band were to suddenly break up this time next year, which they eventually they did. did. So it was obviously in his head. I didn't know that at the time. There had been a rumor. Um, but he handled it very well, and as somebody said to me privately yesterday, he could have put me down very rapidly. But it was a mark of the man that he probably knew I was new, that I wasn't, that I wasn't your normal journalist, to use that word, I wasn't your normal interview in as much as he knew I wasn't experienced enough to kind of maybe know what I was talking about or ask the right questions. But uh, that to me was... was Really, from then on, any interview I did through the years since then was a doddle because I had met my ultimate hero, and I'm very fortunate. And since then, I've interviewed Brian Downey, Brian and I. We're not bosom pals, but we're on first name basis. And anytime we meet, it's always a quick, quick handshake, a good hug, and how are you doing? How's the family? Blah, blah, blah. Same with Scott Gorm. Um, I'm not I'm probably less friendly with him, but I'm, I'm closer to him. He and his wife, his wife is a good friend of mine. Um, Brian Robertson, no, and I, I don't see him. He lives in, I don't know where he lives now. Actually, he's probably in England. But I've been very fortunate, really, in that uh, it's like you and, and, and Bush, if you get the chance to meet them all individually and collectively, I have done that. Um, and I've lot, met a lot of people involved in the whole thing as a uh, family. Um, poor Frank Murray, who died in 2016, he was also the Pogues manager, an absolute gorgeous man and the stories that man could tell. I met uh, John Earl who played uh, saxophone on Dancing in the Moonlight, another man who had a notebook about this thick and it was a who's who of the music industry. And my biggest regret is I never got to talk with him. I had arranged to meet him and talk to him, but he got subsequently got ill and sadly died. He would have been absolutely incredible to talk to because he, who he didn't meet in the industry. Then over the years, um, any of the bands, uh, some of my favorite Irish interviewees would have been in Tuanua. Uh, back in the 80s when I was doing the Pirates, they were bands that I wanted to interview, but I couldn't get near them because 
we were on a pirate and they were all discouraged to go on the pirates. They did the Dublin ones maybe, but going down the country was quite difficult. But I got to know the lads uh, uh, quite well in subsequent years. Uh, uh, we're not like we wouldn't be bosom pals again, but we're, we're friends. And, I, and the... I actually worked with Intuanua um, about a decade ago. It's a, it's it's a funny story, and in the end, it didn't end up going going ahead. But I met all of Intuanua because about a decade ago, they were doing a reunion tour, and yeah. through a weird twist of fate that I'll talk to you about off camera, no problem at all. But I'm not going to talk about it in this video everything didn't go to plan so actually they are amazing leslie you know is just such yeah. a force in nature oh she can still sing like a bird jack dublin is so beautifully lovely paul is is so lovely i was actually at his uh 60th birthday party i got invited it was just nice. you know because we were helping with the tour at the time so yeah they are a great band to talk to very interesting people in the irish industry and again if you look up their history I mean, they had their heyday in the 1980s, and, and, but for a certain twists of fate, they, they, were, they were on the verge and they could have been absolutely mighty. But they, they still had a good run, you know, supporting some of the biggest names in the industry and, and um, some cracking songs. And, and I would encourage people to, to, to go into the back catalogue of, of Into a New and listen to them. And, and indeed, a lot of the bands from, from back in the 80s, I mean, a lot of the bands in the 80s, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the likes of Into a New, I couldn't get near them back in their heyday, because they were so big, they, they wouldn't have had time for somebody like me uh, at, at that time. But that didn't matter, I didn't, I didn't think in those terms in, in those days, really, that oh, they, you know, they're not interested in me, because they were getting better offers, and, and when you're in a band, you, you go for the better offer, obviously. Um, but I, I, I'm glad that now, in, in the last 10 or 15 years, I got to know them quite well, and I've had them on the programme. Uh, I've had Jack in with, with, with his, his other bands as well, and. Uh, another uh, great man to he always has some great stories as well. And more recently, um, uh, Mick from from uh, from uh, Stockton's Wing I had it on the program, and they've become again like a lot of people are friends of mine. They're not what I would call my inner circle of friends, but we know each other and we respect each other. And I respect what they do, and they respect what I do, and that's it. That's all I'm interested in is that they don't look at me on a local radio station as being anything less than doing something on, on the national stations. And they, they, they respect the fact that we're doing what we're doing. And it's all promotion for them at the end of the day. Uh, who else have ever had in, uh, I'd be good friends with Thomas from, from Pogwash, Thomas Walsh, who is another hugely underrated singer songwriter in this country. He has written with, uh, and with Neil Hannon, he and, and he are, are very good friends, but uh, uh, Thomas Walsh himself, uh, has written songs on a par with any pop band you think of. He's hugely influenced by um, the Electric Light Orchestra, and he'd be a big friend uh, of them as well. He, he became friends over the last couple of years. And, and there's just a couple of them who were bands back in the 80s who were the, the pacemakers. That's not, that's not the right word, the trendsetters. Uh, the, or the, what's the word? I'm looking at the, the, the forerunners to what we have now. They're the ones who, who broke the ice that helped Irish bands get to where they are because they had to go through all the rubbish and they had to go and deal with all the record companies in, a, in a, an analog age and everything was slower than it is now. And I'm seeing a lot of them emerge and a lot of reunions like into and order again. I think the Blades did it for a while as well. Stockton's Wing have just done it with a, a fantastic um, uh, compilation album uh, as well. And it's great to see that. Um, uh, what brought us onto that? What was the question initially from that? The interviews that you yeah. rated highly in your career. Other than that, I mean, I, I opened the doors oh, without getting too personal on this. Uh, two years ago, um, there was a tragedy in my life and I just, everything just stopped. And when I went back on air, all I wanted to do was play music. I, I hadn't got the heart to sit down in studio and talk to a band and be jolly and talk about, oh, this lovely, happy sound. I just could not do it. Um, so I, I stopped all interviews and I just just concentrated on the music. But it's starting to come back a bit now. But any of the bands that come in are either I would either invite them or they would ask, "Is there a slot we could we'd love to come on the program?" And I seldom turn people down. This is why I'm doing podcasts now during this crisis. Uh, finally got my own, and thanks to you and Zoom and all the rest, but I managed to get that sorted out. But I'm always fascinated by any band that come into me, be they, be they well-known or unknown. And I find that the unknown bands 
when they get an invite onto the program, they seem to treat me as if, oh my God, Roddy Clear has said you can come on his program. And they come down and they, they're rehearsed to within an inch of their lives. And they come on the program, they can't believe they're on the program. I said, let's relax. It's a radio program, nothing more, nothing less. All I'm doing is offering you a conduit to, through which you can feed your music and sell yourself. Tell me what your single is about. Tell me where your next gig is. Where can you buy your merchandise? Use the, whatever is 40 minutes usually on air, give or take. Use that 40 minutes wisely. Some bands take that really seriously and they, they have everything and, and you know, they, they know what they want to say to me. And, but I always throw them because I ask them questions that they're not expecting. <laughs> Excuse me. And that's deliberate because I, I throw it in there to catch them off guard, see how good they really are. Oh, will you play a live piece of music? I said, yeah, but what happens if, if a string breaks? Let me ask you a question, lads. If you're on stage performing and a string breaks, what do you do? We carry on. Exactly. I don't pre-record my interviews for radio programs. Very seldom. It might be a visiting band, somebody like in Tuanu, I say. But I know they're okay because they're going to do a good job one way or the other. But nine times out of ten, I will ask a band to come in live and, and perform live. Oh, we, uh, we're, we're an electric band. Well, be acoustic for 20 minutes, can you? I said, well, I'm not sure if we can. Well, I said, if you can't do an acoustic set of your live music, what's the point of being in the business? And I'm quite blunt with them because that's the way I see it. You know, if, if all you're going to do is set yourself as a rock band and you can't do it acoustically, what's the point, really? You know, you could argue and stuff on that. But more often than not, they see it as a challenge. And then they suddenly realize, hey, you know something, that's not such a bad idea. Maybe we should throw the odd acoustic song in. Well, why wouldn't you? I said, the rest of the Rolling Stones always did. Queen always did. They always put a little acoustic set in there, a number or two in there. So I, I'm hoping that maybe I'm giving them an option to see more than their little... Because every band that comes in, especially young bands, they think that their single is the best single that's ever been released in the world, ever. And that's a good way to think. You want to say something to you? No, I'm listening. No, but you know what I mean? They, they, and, and a band will... St- they think that this is the best thing they've ever written, and, and rightly so. Obviously, from my point of view, it's not, because I could probably pick off a dozen bands who were way better than them. But that doesn't mean, doesn't give me the right to say to them, you're rubbish, lads. I would never, ever, ever in a month of Sunday say you're rubbish. Because it takes balls for a band, A, to get together and perform and to write, B, then to come on a radio program, probably their debut. A lot of bands that I've had in for interviews it was the first time they've ever been on air, ever, in any radio station. And I take pride in that as well, that as a certain amount of satisfaction that a band who becomes well-known had their first ever radio. And I wouldn't say I break them, I'm not, I'm not that arrogant. But I like to think at least I gave them a little step up that ladder that would help them get, gain confidence that when they do get an interview with Dave Fanning or Tom Dunn or any of these people, that they're prepared for a studio environment. Yeah, yeah, Roddy said we should try this, try that, try the other thing. And that gives me a certain, that's the satisfaction I get from it, saying, yeah, okay, that band, they broke up, but boy, they had a great run. Just luck went against them, you know, and unfortunately, the, the, the road to stardom is paved by so many bands that, that, you know, had great potential, but didn't get the break. And that's the sadness of, of the Irish music industry at the moment. We're not lacking in talent, no way. We're lacking in good luck but not every band can make it, unfortunately. No, that's true. And I <clears throat> have found all these, these anecdotal stories that you've shared with me and kind of all the crossovers we seem to have in life yeah. that I didn't realise until today. Really. Your dad was watching, I want to say hello to him. Hi, Paolo. We have great fond memories of, of many years ago in Italy. And I, my heart goes out and, and he's safe, I presume, in Italy. He's, he's, I think they're, they're isolated nicely. Yeah, my granddad's been self-isolating for about four weeks now. Um, Mom and dad are in France and they've been isolating for about three weeks, a little bit before me. Uh, Maybe granddad is five weeks and they're four weeks. Everyone is safe. I'm ringing them every day and having nice chats. But yeah, it's a worrying time, you know? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, you, I'm sure, particularly more so than anybody I would know, would be quite worried for them because, I mean, Italy got so badly hit. And when you hear the horrific figure, figures of the amount of people that have died, you know, it just 
makes you realize, okay, it's a bit of a pain in the arse having to, to, to confine yourself to the house, but it would mean saving your life. So be it, you know, and, and you know, I, I maybe kind of getting a bit serious here now, but I, I would encourage anybody listening in at the moment. I, I, I put it up on Facebook earlier on. I'm a great believer, or at least I, I, I've discovered that I'm a great believer in the power of positivity and try to be as power as positive as you possibly can. It's not easy. You know, to drag yourself out of bed in the morning and say, right, today I'm going out for a walk. Today I'm going to do something that will keep my mind focused. And, and doing this with you is another little positive step forward on what you're doing with me and, and doing with other people. It, it keeps you, you know, sane and all the rest of it. So, and anybody out there who's having a tough time of it, you know, I'm at the end of a typewriter. I'm typewriter, you hear me? God, that'll tell you how old I am. At the end of a computer. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I quite, I'd say hello to you. I mean, uh, I, I have late night conversations with some very, very, very special people who've come into my life uh, over the last couple of months in particular. Um, I have a lot of good friends out there who've become better friends. And the friends that I knew on the periphery have come into the, you know, I'm sure you're probably the same. I, I think we all need each other more than we ever actually would have cared to admit to before this all started. And I, my fervent hope is that at the end of it all, that we, that the whole world doesn't revert to back the way it was, being bitches and bastards and having to go with each other. It, life is too damn short. I'm getting, I know I'm getting a bit too serious now, but, uh, you know, it doesn't take, I, I'd often be out walking and it doesn't take two seconds to smile at someone. How are you as you're going past? You don't know what kind of a day they're having. And that how are you, you know, here I am, the savior of the world. <laughs> you are not getting too serious. Um, I like to view all these interviews as the person I'm talking to's experience of what life is in confinement. And that's what I want to immortalize with what I'm life doing. I want people to be able to share their experience. Every interview has been completely different and I want to keep it that way. So I'm really grateful for everything you've shared. I would be of the same opinion as you that positivity really, like mm. we're the own masters of our destiny and we're the own masters of our perception. By reframing everything the best way you can, you're actually controlling a lot more of what goes on than you realize but because you're maybe intent on allowing negativity to build a wall, you're not allowing all the beauty in. So if you kind of reframe that and allow yourself to be open to things like even what you're doing right now with the reinvention of how you do your job, obviously right now is a very difficult time for you, I imagine, because you would be. Yeah, I miss being on air. Always did. So being able to use things like Zoom to do your podcast, Roddy, that's a reinvention of self. And that takes a lot of inner work to get work in, but it also takes a creative mind and a positive mind to realize, well, actually, I don't have to be done done. Like you could have decided, well, do you know, I can't get to the radio station, so I'm gonna do nothing, but that's not what you've done. You've reinvented that for yourself and you're trying and you're taking steps forward. And that's very powerful in itself mm -hmm. because that'll inspire other people to do stuff, I hope. I hope so. Yeah, and I, I also felt a sense of, of letting the bands down by not having the radio program. I mean, the radio station took the very correct decision. What they've done is, I think the way it is, this, they're broadcasting from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Anything after, sorry, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Anything after 10 p.m. has been dropped for the time being, and it goes on to automatic, what we call robo-jock. And it was the right decision, but my program fell into that category of 10 o'clock till 1. And the reason being is they wanted to cut down on the amount of bodies within the building. Even in normal circumstances, in any, any radio station, we all use the same microphone. So the, the potential for the flu or a cold bug to be passed around straight away. So I'm diabetic, type 2, so I'm in a high-risk category. And I only spoke to my doctor the other day, and he said, I want you to reinforce, he says, my warning to you is to be very, very careful. Now, thankfully, I'm, I'm actually healthier now than I've ever been because I'm eating properly much more properly than I was. I'm exercising every day. I'm doing four, five, six K a day. But the radio station took the right decision, you know, and, and there was no way I was going to argue against them. But in, at the same time, I felt this sense of um, loss, I suppose, uh, that I, I, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> I'm getting dozens of songs per, 
week per day, whatever. And I can't, I can't play them on the air. I don't have the right facilities here at home uh, to do a radio program. Even if I could broadcast from home, which I would love to be able to do, I don't have the right setup here. But maybe you no, know, when this all is all over, if I can find the money from somewhere, I'll set up myself with a little basic studio here that would allow me to do that. Because, um, and I know people would say to you, it's not your fault, Roddy, and they would all understand that I can't play their music, but it's frustrating for me as a radio presenter of 40 years plus that I can't do it at the moment. And, and I'm two weeks off the air now, and that would normally be a holiday, you know, your two-week break, annual, or whatever. But I, I should be going back next Wednesday, say, if in, in a normal circumstance, but I'm not going to be. Uh, and God knows when it's all going to finish up. But And I hope at the end of it all, I still have a job. I'm, I'm not going to allow that into my head uh, because what will be, will be, it's, it's, it's out of control. And I know that my bosses at the radio station are doing everything they can to keep the float, the boat afloat. And, and by all accounts, uh, they're doing a great job. And I don't know what time you have left on this, uh, Rebecca, but... Um, uh, I've been, as I mentioned earlier on, listening to a lot of music, but I've also been listening to a lot of other radio stations, not just Irish, but right across the world, just dipping in and out, not, not for any length of time. But the one thing that is absolutely amazing is how they've all adapted to using modern technology. Because most radio stations will tell you that if you're doing an interview with Roddy Clear or with Rebecca, make sure you have the best quality, best quality that you can absolutely get. If you can get them in studio, get them in studio, but make sure the quality is this, that, and the other. And you've had the likes of Claire Byrne, Ryan Tuberty, uh, Ken Bruce over in England on BBC Radio 2, all of them broadcasting from their hot presses or their living rooms or whatever, and making the best possible use of the technology at hand. And you know something? It's working. And again, I think that's going to revolutionize radio in that the bosses won't be as uh, pick, picky about the quality of an interview, as long as we get the interview and people can hear it. Now, obviously, we'll go back to a certain standard. That, that's to be expected. But I'm fascinated and, and, and uh, in awe, almost, of, of how they've adapted and, and uh, how the likes of the ordinary listener, they're not saying, oh, your quality on that. You know, if it's really bad quality, they, they stop. Uh, but that's just the technology that they've done, not anything else. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, well done, the industry, the, the broadcast industry. I think they, they've really stepped up. I think the days where quality was more important than content are dwindling. Uh, you might have a point there. People that would be listening to things like podcasts now are more interested in the content rather than the quality. Because we live in a society where everything is faster. It's even like I was let's say getting gigs filmed um, because to me it's really important to have high quality, high content. But the more bands I've spoken to about that, they're actually quite happy to just keep sharing people's Instagram stories because the content brings them more than the quality. So I was looking to invest in, in a side of the business that I might need to reframe for myself. <laughs> um, so that's really interesting. Um, and I really, really appreciate this conversation and, and everything we've done. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more off camera, but uh, what I'll do is I'll turn off the recording in a minute. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time today to speak to me and well, sharing you your side of, of this pandemic and how you feel about creative cabin fever. Um, well, I tell you, you're, you're, you're probably a little bit lucky, uh, really, in some ways, Rebecca, because um, anybody that knows me will know me that I'm despite the fact that I'm on radio, despite the fact that I'm out there in front, in front of camera or in front of stage, or, I'm actually quite a private person. Uh, now, there's a, lot, there's a whole side of me that I obviously wouldn't talk about on camera, and neither would you, but I, I'm, I'm delighted that I got the opportunity to do it with you. And to, to everybody out there that knows me, any friends of mine listening at the moment, I hope you're all well. And I never thought I'd say it, but I can't wait to hug some people. I really can't. Yeah. It, it, even just to shake hands and, and you suddenly realize that the human touch is something that we're social animals and the Irish are particularly social animals. I think we're known as a friendly race. And um, like I said earlier on, I just hope when all of this is over that we've all learned uh, how to appreciate the small things, those little moments that matter. The big things don't, the don't swear. Fuck it. Pardon my French. Just fuck it. The important things are friends, family, 
and get, get all teary eyed now if I keep on going. <laughs> I just, I just feel the exact same, Roddy. Like, I, I'm very fortunate that I have my son with me the last three weeks. He's gone to his dad since yesterday, and I miss him like, like crazy because I've been able to experience what it's like to be a full time mom for the first time in my life. I've actually had a chance. Enjoy, enjoy every second of it because it goes like that. I know. And I'm realizing the importance of that side of my life, which I'd kind of unintentionally been put into the side because I'm so busy working my butt off. If you've learned anything from it, then give time every week when this is all over and divide your time better. I think, a lot, I think there's a shift. There's definitely a shift in people's attitude. Anybody I've spoken to, even neighbours around here. And, and I just hope that some semblance of that remains when this is all over, that people will be that little bit kinder. And I mean, you see it when you go out to the shops that in general terms, people are very good. They're respecting that space. They're respecting, you know, your right to be alive. And, and uh, life is for living. And I've learned that the hard way. I know. And a lot of us, unfortunately, only learn that the hard way. Very few people realize that before it's too late or before a lesson has come. Um, but again, I want to thank you so much for this interview. I'm going to stop recording soon and we'll continue chatting. And I just want to ask anyone at home who's enjoyed this interview to please subscribe to the channel because I do have an incredible amount of more interviews from people from all different walks of life in the music industry, outside of the music industry. I'm trying to call out to all artists to have a platform to talk about their art and why they're important because I think this is a time where we're all realizing just how important the arts are and how much we have to support it. So please get in touch with Viking Promotions and get on the cabin, Creative Cabin Fever with me. Um, thank you so much. You're more than welcome, Rebecca, and thanks very much indeed for, for the invitation. And um, I, I'm sure it won't be too long before we get to meet and get each other in person properly again. Sure, I often meet you around town anyway, but uh, good luck to you and I hope all these are a success, Jim. Thanks everybody. Mind yourselves, you know, wash the hands, stay apart. <laughs>